worship at Second Baptist Church. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. You might be wondering why I'm sitting on the steps outside the sanctuary instead of behind the pulpit, and that's a very good question, and one I'll answer in just a second. But first, parents, just like last week, will you grab your kids and tell them that we are going to have a few minutes of kid stuff right now? Adults, while the kids are getting settled in, can I ask uh, something of you? Can you please, if you're watching on Facebook, either like or comment so that we know that you're watching with us, and then the same thing on YouTube. Will you either like the video or you can subscribe to our channel? All of that just helps us know who is worshiping with us today. Okay, kids, do you know where I am? I'm sitting on the stairs that lead up to the sanctuary right by our little church mouse's hidey hole. Here he is. I know a lot of you know about our church mouse. He has been here for a very long time. Every time I walk up these stairs, I peek in on him and he's just sitting there. And I know lots of you peek in on him too because I see him on Sunday mornings. He just stays there all the time. But guess what? He has been running around and being silly and crazy while we've all been gone and at home. And a lot of you know this because we watched a movie on Wednesday night that showed us what he's been doing. But not everyone at church has seen the movie. So we're going to watch it at the end of the service so that all of our church family can see all the silly things that our silly little mouse has been doing while we have been at home. That's probably enough about the mouse for now. We need to get ready to worship today. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch a short video now, and it explains to us what is worship? What does it mean to worship? After the video, Chip's going to come up and we're going to sing a song of praise to God. So let's worship together. We've come here to worship God today. But what is worship? Worship is more than just singing songs. We sing songs for lots of reasons. Worship is more than just telling God he's good. We call lots of things good. Worship is more than praying or reading the Bible or trying to be nice. Worship happens when someone says, because you've given me everything, God, I'm giving all of me to you today. And then they do. Now let's tell God he's good. And let's sing some songs to him. And let's give him all of us as we worship him today. I invite you to join me this morning as we read in unison. If you need to read it, you may have memorized this psalm as a young child. But we read the beautiful psalm, the 23rd Psalm. Let's read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You're now invited with me to center, to breathe, and to be silent as we acknowledge the presence of our loving God who is with us, who is always with us. Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the New Testament in Philippians chapter 4, Paul invites us to let petitions and praises shape our worries into prayers as we bring our concerns to God. Let us do that now as we pray together. God of peace, in the midst of all that's going on right now, we long for your comfort. 
especially for those in our midst who are sick and in need of your healing. We pray that you would comfort Lisa, Don, Aaron, Melissa, and Ben Long as they grieve for Lisa's dad, Roger. We pray for Mary Arnold as she grieves for her mother, Linda. We pray for Alberta, Bob, and Janice Corum as they grieve for Randy. We pray for all those who are experiencing all kinds of loss right now in the wake of terrible tornadoes that swept through Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas this past week. And we pray for our friends at the Upland Holistic Development Project in Thailand as they recover from storm damage as well. We also ask for your healing comfort for Daryl, Janice, Andy, Diane, Kent, and so many others on our hearts and minds right now, even as we celebrate with Scott and Cindy Lakin in the birth of their new granddaughter, Hattie. O oh God of hope, you are indeed our light, our strength, and our song, always ready to guide us in paths of righteousness, to lead us beside quieting waters, always ready to restore our souls. Our good shepherd, we need you to restore our souls this morning. As we walk through darkened valleys, we long for your comforting companionship in the midst of our fear. O oh God, we long to sense that you are near. Near to us and near to all who are struggling in the midst of these strange times. In Genesis, you are called Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And we are so thankful for all the ways you provide for us and for all those you use to deliver that provision. We are grateful for our farmers, grocery store workers, and delivery drivers, for all the people who continue to work each day so that people are able to eat. We ask you to bless and protect them as they serve. Give them grace to handle disgruntled customers during supply shortages. Keep their bodies healthy as they unload and stock boxes of resources. Keep their cars and trucks running smoothly as they deliver needed supplies and food people have ordered online. And please protect them and their loved ones from this virus. God, we pray that you would provide for these essential workers just as we pray for your provision in the lives of those whose livelihoods have been threatened. It is scary and can be overwhelming not knowing how bills and obligations will be met. So, as people feel financial strain during the uncertainty, we pray that you would bring them comfort and peace, reminding them that in the midst of it all, you are with us. Great physician, we are mindful that as more people get sick, our healthcare workers and first responders are working longer hours with fewer supplies and an increasing risk of contracting this virus themselves. So please renew their energy and sustain them on long shifts. Bring your protection upon them as they work with patients. Multiply their supplies so that they have the protective items needed to stay safe on the job. Inspire and invigorate the research doctors developing better tests to diagnose the virus, to create vaccines, and to identify protocols to eliminate its spread. And in the midst of all of this, help us to help them as we can in all the best ways we can. God of wisdom, we ask that you would help us to do whatever we can to keep this virus from continuing to spread. May we all, especially our leaders, seek your wisdom daily. Be with people making decisions that affect the lives and futures of our families, communities, countries, and the wider world. We pray that they would communicate clearly, truthfully, and calmly with each other, and with the public. Give government officials the ability to safely handle people arriving from other countries and to always do that with love, understanding, compassion, and care. May truth and empathy 
and love be the touchstones of people setting policies for our protection. God of grace, we desperately need your grace. And right now, we also need you to help us to be gracious with ourselves and with others. As our families continue to adjust to everyone being home, we ask that you would guide us in our new realities. Give spouses grace for each other. Prompt worn-out parents to speak words of kindness and encouragement to their children. Help children find creative ways to experience the beauty of all you have created as they continue their learning. Help us to have grace with ourselves as we discern what to do and what not to do. And in the midst of it all, help us to seek and to find your presence, your beauty, and your grace each day as we navigate this season and this life together. For it's in the name of the living Christ, the one who came that we may have life and that we might have it to the full, that we pray. Amen. A reading from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, 
I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. So how are you? How are you doing? How are you right now in this moment? How have you been in the past few weeks, the past month, the past six weeks? I've been asking this question to many people and the responses have varied, and they vary widely. For some of our introverts, our introverted friends, they're asking the question, what is all the issue about? <laughs> Being at home in their own space is, is comfortable, right where they may want to be. While I have other friends, many of them extroverts are, are dying on the inside because they are waiting with so much anticipation for when they will have an opportunity to be in close proximity with the people whom they love. Medical professionals have responded with the deep care and concern about what an efficient virus has the capacity to do. Many are concerned and even anxious about its spread. Meanwhile, educators are in a place right now where they are thinking about and praying for their students because for many of them, they will not get a chance to interact with them again before the end of the year. And so they're thinking of creative ways to keep their students engaged and moving forward in their learning. Small business owners are concerned about when they may be able to fully reopen. And even some are asking the question if they will even be able to open their, their doors ever again. And parents of newborns are in this tug of war of wanting to introduce their new babies to their, this world, to their family, and to their friends, while at the same time wanting to hold them and shelter them so that they may not be exposed to COVID-19. And churches, community groups, and families are all asking the question, when will things go back to what we kind of have known as normal? These are a few of the many ways that people are carrying this right now. And the reason why is because each one of us experiences a crisis differently. And each one of us is experiencing this crisis differently. Just one look at our rapid response survey submissions will show us that there are a wide array of concerns and fears and anxiety and restlessness and more. And each one of us is experiencing that in our own ways. One thing we can say is that there is not one person who has not been impacted by the changes in our daily lives. And these changes have a way of stressing us and they have a way of stretching us in ways that have previously been untested. And it's in times like this where the newness of life and of social distancing is starting to wear off and the novelty of new schedules and time at home and staying at home is starting to wear thin and fatigue may even be setting in. We're all feeling it in our own ways. We're longing and hoping for better days. And as we consider our own thoughts and emotions and our own health and the health of others in this time, the message from the Gospel of John that we have heard this morning seems to be right on time for us. It's a message of trust and comfort 
in a time that feels all but comfortable. You see, John's gospel is a gospel of energy, and it is a gospel of insight. And he writes to us about the divine nature of Jesus, and he puts the divine nature of Jesus in full view for all to see. John wants his readers to see that Jesus was not only human, but divine. The word of God having put on flesh and living and breathing and moving amongst us. The Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. John's message of good news is that salvation has come through Jesus and that Jesus can be trusted even in difficult times, especially in difficult times. What good news that was for them to hear and what good news is that for us this morning? With so many thoughts and questions and conspiracies floating around as to why we are going through a global crisis, it is good for us to be reminded of the nature of Jesus. Because to see Jesus is to see God. And to understand Jesus and his nature is to understand God's nature. In our passage today, Jesus uses the metaphor of a sheep and a sheep's gate to give the readers insight into his divine nature and reveal how God cares for us. Jesus describes the nature of a shepherd, and he contrasts that with the nature of thieves and robbers and bandits, and that contrast is made for emphasis. You see, while robbers come to steal all that is good, and while thieves and robbers abandon the sheep in times of peril, the good shepherd, in contrast, is in relationship with the sheep and cares for the sheep in an individual and personal basis. The implication is this, that God cares for all of us and will not abandon us in times of peril. What a hope we have when it seems as if, as if so many things that we have trusted in have come up short that we can trust Jesus who remains faithful and who remains consistent. As a teenager, I remember a song that my church back at home used to sing. And I find myself in times like this recalling songs and this particular song is a song that I remember singing and I even sing now in times of difficulty. A song written by Kirk Franklin. The name of it is just Silver and Gold. He says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. No fame or fortune or riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. And I would be as all but cautious to try to sing the verse to you because the person who sings this sings it with so much soul. But I would like to read the verse to you this morning. It says, don't give me a mansion on top of the hill. And don't give me the world with a shallow thrill. But just give me a savior, my life he can hold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I woke up this morning feeling kind of down. I called on my best friend. She could not be found. But I called on Jesus, my life he can hold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. And it's interesting to me how my understanding of that song has changed from a teenager to an adult and being in adulthood. Because I realize that what Kirk Franklin is not saying, he's not saying that we don't need our friends. And what he's not saying is that we don't need finances. No, we do need to be with people and in community. And yes, we do need finances to take care of things and to purchase things and to, to buy and make provision for ourselves. 
But what I believe that he's pointing out to us is that sometimes our friends, as much as we love them and they love us, may not be available in the ways that we hoped. And sometimes our finances will rise and fall. 401ks, they grow and they shrink with the perils of the economy. But not so with Jesus. He will not abandon you. And he does not abandon us. And the message that Jesus brings to us as the good shepherd is that he is faithful. He will not abandon us. According to our passage, Jesus makes the connection between his nature and the practices of a good shepherd who cares for their sheep. The shepherd calls out to the sheep. The shepherd knows the name of the sheep and the shepherd leads the sheep into goodness and life, a life that is abundant and to the full. It is a word of comfort to those who need it most. That in the same way that the shepherd of that day would name their sheep and knew the sheep apart from each other, Jesus knows each one of us by name, and apart from others. Herein lies another truth, that we are known by Jesus and that he knows us in a way that is intimate. You see, I recall a clip that I saw on Facebook, and there are a lot of clips that are floating around now that our sports are not really in session. And it was a clip of a little boy, he couldn't have been more than about five or six years old, and his parents had gotten him some really good seats at an NBA uh, basketball game, and he was about six feet back from courtside. And the little boy looks out, and right along courtside, he saw his favorite basketball player, Kevin Durant. And Kevin Durant was about six rows in front of him and the little boy decides to call out to his favorite basketball player. He says, Kevin Durant. And it was a pretty loud arena at the time and so nobody really heard him. But the little boy was not deterred. So he stood up again and he yells out, Kevin Durant. And this time there were a couple of people who were in a few rows in front of him who heard him and they turned and they looked and they started smiling and laughing. But Kevin Durant did not hear him. And so the little boy, not giving up, not being deterred, looks up again and he says with everything in him, he says, Kevin Durant. And Kevin Durant heard him and turned and looked at him and smiled and said, what's up? And that little boy, when he heard that, fell and crumpled in his seat and began to giggle and giggle and giggle. And then he turned to his mom and he said, Mom, he heard me. There's something special about that moment between that boy and Kevin Durant. That in the midst of a noisy arena, KD and that moment with that boy was delighted. And he was delighted to call out to his favorite basketball player. I'd like to think that God also delights in calling out to us by our names and that God delights when we respond. The good shepherd calls out to the sheep. In ordinary days where things are mundane and also in difficult times when things seem to not be right the way we want them to be, But not only does the good shepherd call out to the sheep, and not only does he know the sheep, but he also leads the sheep, even through difficult places. As Psalm 23, which we read in unison earlier, says and brings to light, there are times when we must go through difficult seasons, what the psalmist calls the valley of death, where things look dark. And we may not be able to see our way out. But through it all, we learn that we can trust in the good shepherd who is ultimately guiding us into green 
pastures. There is a hope here that we can come to, live in, and go through it all with the Good Shepherd. These are the promises that Jesus makes to the hearers in John. And these are the promises that are helpful for us this morning. And so what are the implications for us? What does it mean for a church that understands itself to be Jesus' sheep? The implication is that Jesus influences how we live. And how we live in him and how we live amongst each other. It challenges us to consider his nature and love for all. And it challenges us to view the community the way that Jesus views us. This is the full life. A life that seeks to trust in God because God has our best interests and cares at heart. It is a life that follows Jesus so that his life even and especially influences our own. It is a life where we are not just cared for, but we, because we know his nature, care for others, because we know that he deeply cares for all. We are to live out our lives in the model of community that Jesus lives, a model of trust in him, even in difficult circumstances. One of the ways that we do that and that we are doing that as a community at Second Baptist is by exploring a trust-filled response to the question of when and how we as a worshiping community will get back together. We've developed a task force and it is formed to consider not just the when but the how and the safest way that we can join back together. As a community, we must consider the well-being and safety of all of our community because we do believe that Jesus is concerned about the safety and well-being of all. And we want to ensure a faith-filled, informed, loving response in line and in character with Jesus' nature. And there are other ways that we are in community, and there are other ways that we are responding. For example, our rapid response team has and continues to reach out and check in with many of our members of our congregation to ensure that they are okay. Notes of encouragement are being written by many groups, community groups, leaders, and teachers, and members, and they're going out daily. Food deliveries and meal trains are happening right here in our congregation. And not just for us, but beyond our community and our four walls, we are giving to in as much so their pantries can be full also. Hundreds of masks have been made by teams in our congregation and distributed not just to us, but to those in our neighborhoods and businesses and all of those who are needed. Our giving continues to our local and our global partners. Yes, we are in difficult times, but we want to make sure that we are found faithful in giving to them also so that their work and ministry can continue. Our community is staying connected in worship in unique ways, as some of you all may have seen on Facebook. Second Friends teachers are using technology to Zoom with their classes. And just seeing their students' faces and their students seeing their faces put a smile to them and encourage them to keep going and keep going and keep going. Charles is connecting with our student ministry with the 10 Minutes at 2, which I know many of you all have had a chance to see, where they have been wonderful, lighthearted, yet deeply uh, impactful devotions that will help us and help our students by uplifting our spirits. And Heather has implemented creative ways to keep our children engaged, like with Zoom parties and also our little surprises, like the video that our children will see at the end of this worship service. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd. And Jesus leads and is leading us to be a caring community for each other, even as he cares for us. 
And so what is Jesus leading you to do? This day, this week, in your home, in your neighborhood, and in your city. And how might you bear witness to Jesus, the good shepherd, who gathers all unto him? Join us in this hymn of response as we consider how God supplies all of our needs and how we may join in in the caring of the needs of others. to our 2BC family and friends. Uh, we thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I want to let you know that we have many things that are taking place uh, amongst our congregation, and I'd like to share a few of those things with you. And one of the ways we can do that is by letting you know that we have our May monthly newsletter. It is coming in the mail this week. But just in case you don't like snail mail, there is an opportunity to download that online. And so we have that available for you as well. We also want to be sure that we uh, let you know that, that we are trying to find more ways to connect with you. And one of the ways we are doing that is with a communication survey. 
And so there is a link on the, our homepage uh, of the hub on 2bcliberty.org slash events that you can go there or you can also um, find the link on our newsletter or we will have the link emailed to you. You can see how important this is to us. So hopefully you find that, take a few moments and fill that out for us. And if you don't like technology, there will be a hard copy of the survey coming to you this week. Also, we want to let you know that May 3rd is our anniversary Sunday, which we're super excited about. We will observe communion together, apart, but yet together. And so the way that you're able to do that is uh, by gathering your own elements. So you'll have to gather your own bread and, and uh, um, your own drink to go with that. And uh, we'll just do that in the same fashion as we did for Good Friday. Now, the service portion of our anniversary Sunday, uh, just to let you know, that's the serve part of our Sunday. We will do that at a later time in October. Yeah, I'd also like to let you all know that we have a new virtual community group starting May 7th. It's called Praying the Psalms, and it is an awesome opportunity to work through the Psalms and also to pray. And it is offered at two times, both at noon and 7 p.m. Also, we have something special for our educators that you can join in with. And the theme of it is called You're on a Roll. And we are thanking our 2BC educators. And one of the ways you can do that is, of course, sign up on the Hub. But uh, what we're doing is allowing a time for us to write a personal note of encouragement to our educators and also doing something that is encouraging or fun with it. And since the theme is you're on a roll, you can offer a Tootsie Roll or a Lifesaver Roll or a Cinnamon Roll or any other rolls you want to add in there with them. Uh, Cool thing happening for our children. Children, listen, listen up. We have a Zoom party that is happening every Wednesday at 6.30. Kids K through second grade can join in. And then we also have at 7 uh, o'clock, um, the third through fifth grade can join in. So that's something that you're interested in. You can contact Heather. Also, as mentioned earlier, uh, Charles has the 10 at 2. Uh, video blog devotional. If you have not had a chance to see that, it is great. Please join in. And uh, it's a great time. And it's not just for students. So adults, you uh, can join in with that as well. Uh, for our Food Share Sunday, which is next Sunday, we are encouraging you to do two things to help out in as much. The first thing that you can do is drop off your donations on Wednesday mornings directly to in as much. And the second thing that you can do is if you are online savvy and you're able to make an online order, do the order and have that sent directly to in as much. Now, those are the things I have. But as our uh, for our special video that Heather has prepared, I want you to gather all the children around. So children, if you dozed off or if you went to play somewhere, come back, come back. This time is for you. And as you're making your way in front of the screen, I want to thank Don and I also want to thank Jack and Kim for taking the time to put this together but we have a special video for you and this was a video that was shown Wednesday but now we're making it available to everybody let's watch it together if you give a mouse a day alone in the church he will creep out of his hidey hole to have a look around and if he creeps out to have a look around he will spot a purple candle and want to take a sniff. Can you guess where he goes to sniff the candle? Where in the church is he? If he scurries up to sniff the candle, he will want to climb a little higher to look out over the pews. Can you guess where the mouse will go next? Where in the church is he? If he climbs the pulpit to see the pews, he will notice an even higher spot with a better view. Can you guess where the mouse will go next? Where in the church is he? 
If he goes to the balcony for a better view, he will notice some knobs and buttons that look fun to press. Can you guess what he sees? Where in the church is he? If he scampers onto the soundboard and turns it on, he will need to find some music to listen to. Can you guess where he finds the music? Where in the church is he? If he goes to the sound booth to play a CD, he will need a way to listen to it. Can you guess what he will do next? Where in the church is he? If he stays in the sound booth to listen to some music, he will eventually feel hungry. Can you guess his favorite snack? Where in the church is he? If he eats some candy in Pastor Connie's office, he will want to see another pastor's office. Can you guess where he will go next? Where in the church is he? If he stops for a visit in Pastor Jason's office, he will look for a Kleenex, but he won't find any on the desk. Can you guess where he will go to find a box of Kleenex? Where in the church is he? If he climbs onto a pew and stands on the collection plate to reach a Kleenex, he will realize that there is an instrument he would like to play while he's back in the sanctuary. Can you guess what instrument he will play? Where in the church is he? If he plays a hymn on the organ, he will get very tired from pressing all the keys and will decide to take a rest in the sunlight. Can you guess where he will go to soak up the sunlight? Where in the church is he? If he looks out the stained glass window until the sun goes down, he will be ready for bed. Can you guess where he will go next? When he's ready for bed, he will snuggle up in his hidey hole and fall asleep, dreaming of the day the kids will all come back and he will be with his friends at the church. Well, thanks to Kim and Jack Kankowitz for their work on that and to Heather for all the creative work she and other leaders are doing in children's ministry right now. Friends, may the one who seeks you find you when you fall. May the one who loves you take delight in your living. And may the one who sends you send you now in joy. For in your gladness and in your grieving, in your brokenness and in your healing, in your faithfulness and in your leaving, the one who made you and redeemed you is the one who keeps you still. Amen.